I think spotlighting some of the the organizational sources is is really helpful. Can you share a little bit more about some of the observations you've seen of of where conflict oftentimes comes up in the context of engineering leadership? Yeah, I mean, I think when it comes to engineering in particular, uh, a good place to look at is any sort of decision-making point that affects one or more individuals or teams. And so common ones are, are kind of technical decisions around software design. Um, so oftentimes when, when I think about conflict optimization, the first question I ask is how do you, pe- how do you design software, right? How does this group uh, collaborate to make software design decisions? How are those decisions documented? Who is involved in those decisions, right? So, you know, if we, you know, we are a knowledge organization, right? All software organizations are knowledge organizations. And each individual in that organization is like a neuron in the brain. And if we're making decisions about how to design software without using all of our neurons, then we're not maximizing our potential. And if we're we're not kind of uh, you know committing to to one collaborative approach after having leveraged that information, if we are constantly struggling between these neurons, right, then we're not acting as a single unit. So there's there's definitely you know software design is a huge part of that within engineering organizations, but there's other ones too. Um, you know, certainly like who does what project can be a source of conflict and understanding how to create an organization chart that makes that super clear, making sure teams aren't understaffed or overstaffed in ways that that can cause conflict in terms of staffing decisions. Um, so I think, you know, definitely the, the top two are got to be technical decisions around software design or, or kind of global policies like language policies or repo strategies. Uh, and then people decisions, staffing on particular projects, how folks are, are evaluated in terms of performance, making sure people have, you know, the opportunity and expectations uh, that, that they need uh, to be able to be held accountable, but also be celebrated when they are successful. I think that it really distills like some really clear areas. Do you have a, an example or a story that you could share of, of your experience, uh, I guess, being a part of a situation where conflict arises either in like the, the technical or software design decision-making, global policies on language, um, or staffing or performance evaluation? Is there is there a story that comes to mind for you uh, when one of these areas came up? Yeah, well, one that comes to mind, when I was at Pinterest, um, we were working on a shared mono rep- uh, repository. So our, our repository strategy at that time, and probably still is true at Pinterest, is we had per language mono repos. Uh, and so I was putting together a, you know, specification for how the Python repository should be organized. We didn't have a dedicated team that owned this. And so as, you know, one of the people who, who led the efforts on the biggest Python service and kind of, you know, used a lot of the code base and was really deeply involved across the board, you know, I felt like I was in a position to, you know, create some structure here and move things forward. And we had a... And a colleague of mine who uh, worked on a similar sort of, you know, system uh, in the same repository, and uh, we we had kind of differing opinions as to how this repository should be structured. So he he wanted to have source and test directories at the top level. Uh, I wanted to have kind of services, libs, tools at the top level, and then you know you can dig in to have tests and at each kind of layer underneath that. Neither strategy is necessarily better than the other. Um, reasonable people could disagree. They come with trade-offs, right? If you, you know, his argument was if you put source and test at the top level, it makes people think about tests more. That's probably true. Uh, my argument was if you put source and test kind of within each team scope level, then you enable people to move more quickly independent of each other and reduce overcoupling of code, which is probably also true. Um, <laughs> but either strategy could come with additional tactics that would mitigate those trade-offs. And so at the end of the day, it's really six of one, half dozen of the other, right? And um, I think we we ended up, you know, the part of the challenge is there was no clear owner here. There was no tech lead who was the clear and legible owner that everyone agreed upon. This person would do, be the tiebreaker when reasonable people could disagree. Uh, and so we, we, we kind of, I think, ended up more or less taking it to a vote. And, and collectively deciding as a group. Um, and we move forward with, with the, uh, uh, one of the two proposals. I won't share which. And it's not really important which, frankly. Uh, and the, the experience was amazing for me because it was very easy to have this kind of conflict. Um, 
with my counterpart. I think he he took it very well. Um, I took it very well. We collaborate as a group very well. And I think a part of that is the maturity of the folks involved uh, and also the, the shared interests of the people that we're working together. And the challenge is that if you have an engineering organization that doesn't have those things, right, uh, and doesn't have a clear owner who can kind of be responsible for making decisions when reasonable people could disagree within a particular domain, that, that is a, a recipe for conflict. I am so excited to get to the how here because conflict, my stress level just blows right up to red. And like thinking about a time where I have a, a difference in opinion or maybe could reasonably disagree with another approach uh, definitely stresses me out. And, and Jerry, Jerry has been a part of most of those conversations. But the thing is, and what I really admire about Jerry is he, he really does a great job of helping diffuse that with me and, and like helping us kind of understand we're both coming from the same place. And so, Jerry, I don't know if you took a master class on this like w- way long ago. Um, but anyway, I know we're going to dive into some, some examples and how. Jerry, you're, you got something to say. What's up? No, I mean, um, it just, um, I can't test that conflict really a way, a good pass to build trust and, and absorb different, um, opinions. So in, in the end you make better decisions The organization performs better if you can navigate through those conflicts to a, a positive outcome. Jerry, when we were, when, uh, Jordan was sharing a couple of the different sort of hotspots for conflict in an engineering leadership organization or an engineering organization, was there anything like things that came to your mind where you're like, oh shoot, like that one reminds me of this conflict? A lot. So um, those kind of debates happens very often in engineering teams, especially among people that are more experienced in one area or the other. Like they are uh, more opinionated and uh, it's harder to see the other side of the story. So as an engineering leader, we often in a position that we have to almost really raise the uh, awareness and the empathy so that you can see, uh, like as Jordan pointed out, uh, neither is the absolute right answer, but the, the challenge is really to help one party to see the other's perspective. Because in, at the end of the day, we all share the same goal, we want the company to, to be successful, we want to, whatever architecture decision we made, we want to ensure the uh, software de- development process will be uh, flexible, you know, uh, rapid, uh, and agile. The challenge of being your leaders is just, just that, uh, how do you, how do you navigate those conflict? Because, uh, a lot of people are just n- not prepared to, to, to handle that in the right way. 